Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for still being here um, at the end of a, a fantastic but a tiring day. I think I feel like you've managed to squish two days of conference into one day, Demetrios. It's been, uh, it's been amazing. Um, and I hope that my, my paper actually follows on quite nicely, particularly um, from John's. I feel like you've, you've laid the ground for um, some of the things that I want to talk about. And John has said that he has inverted, in a way, the challenge of the conference. And I think my paper sits a little bit in between the two, in between human rights and criminal procedure, and thinking about um, the role of research in both how we um, think about the development and the implementation of those norms um, in individual member states. OK, so um, just an overview, um, in case, case you uh, lose the thread a little bit later on. Um, so I've got a couple of main points here. I think there's a real tension between universality and effectiveness here in terms of us having a transnational norm, be it Article 6 fair trial rights, be it an EU directive and so on, that it's sufficiently broad so that it feels universal, so that we can all buy into it, we can all get behind it, but it's not so broad that we can find a million ways to get around it. So we also need it to be sufficiently prescriptive and narrow to be effective, but without feeling as if this is something that's alien and being imposed upon us. And I'm going to take as my examples um, the uh, European Court of Human Rights and the Saldus case in particular um, and the EU Directive on the Right to Legal Assistance. And I think they're interested in because they are developed in different ways and of course they have different objectives as um, case law and as a piece of, uh, as a legislative um, measure. And I also just want to think about research as a component of developing these kind of um, transnational norms in a way that will be effective in practice. So what did we learn from Salders? What did we learn from states' responses to Salders? And how might, might we then develop a directive as we then did in a way that takes account of what we know of states' responses, of how things are implemented in practice, of the different ways in which member states organise their criminal justice processes. So we basically have a better chance of having an instrument um, that's going to be effective in practice. And when looking at that, I think it tells us something about actually the broadly binary um, nature of criminal processes. So I'm a comparativist, so I'm interested in uh, differently organised criminal justice traditions, procedures and so on, broadly adversarial and inquisitorial. But despite those differences, what you see is the responses when we're looking at um, the right to a lawyer, for sure, is actually things in, across all of those jurisdictions break down to there's the investigation and prosecution side, there's the police, there's the I want to have an effective investigation side and the defence rights side. And you see that very clearly in the French system um, where there is a sort of a, a claim judicial supervision type model um, in very similar ways um, to in England and Wales and the common law processes. Um, and I also just want to talk about and just, just remind us about the way that we can legislate for some things and not others. So Paul talked about, you know, these hard-working um, soft laws or soft norms. Um, and I think that's, that's very much been the case in terms of um, access to a lawyer and ways in which we've been able to finesse and tweak and try and make those things more effective in practice. The rule is a really good starting point, but it's never going to be enough. We all know that changing a rule will not suddenly um, magically change our behaviour. So universality versus this kind of um, cultural fit. As I say, that's about having transnational good practices um, and the importance of standards that are effective um, in practice. So therefore taking account in some ways of legal, occupational, political cultures within which they're going to be translated and implemented. So you might start off with a broad norm, but be aware then, so that's got to then take effect um, in either all the members of the Council of Europe um, or the member states of the European Union. Um, and I think when you have too rigid a framework, um, then you get more resistance, more pushback, um, and this feeling that this is a cultural transplant, something that's alien to your system um, that you're being asked to um, get behind. So you often see that uh, the complaint is often made in France, this is the imposition of Anglo-Saxon um, values. And this is something that actually is not, is not a good fit and is not appropriate um, for France. Um, However, the danger is, the risk is that universality is achieved at the price then of these very minimally agreed norms. You make something so broad that actually it's not so effective and there are many ways um, to get around it. So just, so just so you know where I'm coming from, I'm a lawyer, socio-legal, empirical, um, doing, I'm engaged in qualitative research, and that's really the, the, the sort of perspective from which um, I approach the questions that I'm talking about today. Um, so I'm thinking about the way that 
these contextual factors drive behaviour and how that might help us to understand how we might best frame some of these norms, how we might translate um, from either from broader international norms down to the uh, domestic or how we might even try to influence some of those norms, particularly at the EU level, which is something I've been a little bit involved in just through impact assessments and a couple of empirical um, projects funded by the European um, Commission. And so that's a very different approach from that, hey, let's find out what other countries do, let's wang out a survey to, you know, 50 ministers of justice and then claim that we understand what's going on in those systems. No, we don't. Those will give you lovely textbook, idealised rhetorical accounts of law rather than tell you what's actually happening um, on the ground. Okay, so I can do this um, fairly quickly because John has gone into it um, in some quite useful detail. So... I'm just thinking about this space between when we've had Salders as a European Court of Human Rights decision, and then I conducted a research project post Salders, but just before the directive, and something that would feed into it. And so it was, it's, I just thought it might be interesting to reflect on some of the lessons um, that we had from, from that project and that we tried to feed in. So the challenge post Salders, so as, as we've already heard, um, a universal right to custodial legal advice as part of a fair trial. It was a more prescribed standard. There was less room for the margin of appreciation in principle, you know, defence rights irretrievably prejudiced and so on. Um, and we wouldn't, we wouldn't have this more holistic view of, OK, you're not really um, abiding by the rights here, but you can fix that later. Um, so that seemed to be fairly clear, but we know that that was implemented in very different ways across different jurisdictions. So in Scotland, they didn't think they had to do anything. In the Netherlands, they said, well, you know, Salders was a terrorist, Salders was a juvenile. These are not things that we have to um, actually um, change our own law for. Um, then we had the EU directive on um, access to lawyer for suspects, which came uh, quite a few years later. Was it in 2013, I think? Um, and Salders was in 2008. Um, and so that, had a, that, was, that was a piece of EU legislation, obviously, and that was around um, promotion of mutual trust, underpinning mutual recognition and so on. So in a different context, different legal context, different um, objective. But the opportunity to be more prescriptive, um, no margin of appreciation, that direct effect of the directive, the process of negotiation, discussion, impact assessments, um, this is something that you're not relying on the sort of slight randomness of case law at the European Court of Human Rights. This is, we've decided this, we have a roadmap of rights, we're all getting together, we've got representatives from all the member states. So it's a different kind of approach. You would expect us to be able to, to get behind that differently and the opportunity for much more detail. Um, I can't actually read the last thing on my slide because of the sun. Um, okay, ah, I think, I think it's a little postscript there saying... Um, building on the European Court of Human Rights. Um, and for a while, it was, we were looking to the European Court of Rights as having, you know, really paving the way. And then Ibrahim and Simeone was like, oh gosh, what are we going to do now? What happens when actually the EU directive standard seems to be a bit higher than the European Court of Human Rights jurisprudence? How are we going to um, resolve that? Can you see the screen? Yeah, okay, so you can... Uh, <laughs> I might have to ask you what it says in a bit. Um, so the challenge from um, when we think about this comparatively, and a couple of people have said it would be good to know more um, for, for courts to be more informed by those um, different member state traditions and so on, um, is I don't want to overstate it, but I think it is important that there are different um, legal procedural traditions and cultures, which means that sometimes things don't feel like they're a good fit. So if, you have a, if, if the understanding is that the prosecutor as a judicial officer is doing lots of the work that the defence lawyer would do, you have to take that into account um, and think about how that different balance of power and responsibility um, might work um, to then think about how you would implement um, the, the right to a criminal defence lawyer. Um, reluctance of states to reform just, just at the legal level. So the reason that some of these reforms happened post Salders was because of the activism of lawyers. So we had CADA to then move things on um, in Scotland, for example. We also had um, a question of constitutional importance going uh, to the Constitutional Council in France. And again, that's what eventually pushed on the reform to say, not just lawyers before, but actually during um, the interrogation. 
But there is this danger if you just have these top-down pronouncements like Miranda, um, that it's very easy to say that as a, as a pronouncement at that kind of you know, grand meta level. But then actually that requires a whole lot of organisation and it requires resources and so on um, for people actually to get behind it um, on, the, um, on the ground level. So I think there's this resistance at the level of states often doing what the minimum um, of what's important and also a resistance if things are framed in a way that then feel alien um, to that particular state. So if we're thinking about developing appropriate um, standards, obviously we need to be very clear in terms of the objectives um, of what's going to be achieved. And Article 6 has been that broad standard, but as I say, once we get down to thinking about an EU directive, then we could think about um, a lot more detail and we could be more prescriptive than the kind of thing that I think would be appropriate um, in the, at the sort of level of a decision of the European Court of Human Rights. Um, I think it's really helpful to have some research evidence that actually reflects current practices rather than idealised accounts. Because if we proceed on the basis of idealised accounts, we're not going to quite get it right um, in terms of understanding how things actually work. So we want to understand legal and professional cultures. We want to understand that there are different contours of criminal justice systems that they share um, rights and responsibilities out differently. You know, all the whole thing about false friends of language, when we talk about a prosecutor, the CPS and the French procureur are miles apart in some ways, even though they share many of the same um, functions. Okay. Um, so the value of a research base, just again, not, not, to, not to say that England and Wales has been fantastic, but just England and Wales started on this journey back in 1984 um, with PACE in terms of thinking about defence rights. And we learned some really important lessons there in terms of the responses of the legal actors there. So with lawyers, we discovered that actually whilst lawyers had really wanted the right to custodial legal advice, it turned out they were really quite poorly prepared for that. Um, they weren't prepared for the extent of 24-hour demand for their services, and they responded um, with unqualified, inexperienced and largely untrained um, advisors. And so what that taught us is, okay, we don't just say, here's a right to a lawyer, but we think about how do we ensure the proper provision for that lawyer? Let's make sure there's legal aid to pay them. Footnote, 1993, first time lawyers are available in the police station in France. Day one, they all went on strike because the government forgot to make provision for legal aid. So you had a right to a lawyer, but that lawyer couldn't be paid. So we learn we not just need this right, but we also need to think about making sure these people are trained, that we have the provision of proper, um, competent lawyers, um, and so on. Similarly, of the police, we didn't have buy-in from the police. They resisted this. They saw this as antithetical to their role, undermining the effectiveness. Um, they didn't really buy into the idea that actually having a defence lawyer might enhance in any way the criminal process, its reliability, um, and so on. And so they actually then sought to undermine those rights by saying, if you've got nothing to hide, you don't need a lawyer, or it'll keep you here longer, or um, not telling people that it was actually free at the point of delivery. And again, altering the codes of practice were a really useful way of saying, so here are some things that you must do. Here's a right to a lawyer, and by the way, police, you need to tell suspects they have a right to a lawyer. Um, a bit like France, had the right to silence in theory, but it wasn't until actually quite recently that um, suspects had to be told of the right to silence. Not terribly helpful. Um, you know, they ha you need pre professional training can be really useful in terms of getting people to understand what do these rights mean in practice. Why might I think they're valuable? And if I think they're valuable, then I'm more likely um, to actually buy into them and not seek um, to actually get around them. And so looking at things like, so there's a piece of research that we did that um, resulted um, in a book called Inside Police Custody, which was looking at the Netherlands, France, Scotland, and England and Wales. And what was interesting is it wasn't so much, there were differences between those jurisdictions, but it wasn't so much about whether or not they fell into the adversarial or the inquisitorial camp, but it was about the point that they were on on their kind of journey of due process protections. So the sorts of things we saw in the early days post-PACE, in England and Wales, or in the 1990s when lawyers first came in um, to the police station um, in uh, France, were very much what we saw in the Netherlands, where actually post Salders is where lawyers were, were first making their entrance um, into the police station. So the, the police resistance was almost identical 
It was as if there was some kind of script that they all followed. It was exactly the same words that when I'd done my research in the kind of latter part of the 20th century and in those kind of post paced years, early post paced years when I was doing my PhD, it was sort of like going back in time and hearing this all over again. The police were saying all the same kinds of things. Um, and as I say, antithetical to the ineffective investigation and, you know, obstructs truth and justice. And I was just going back and looking at some of the interviews and there's a, there's a great quote from a police officer who talks about saying, well, I guess it's the defence lawyer's job to obstruct justice, but I just don't think that's a very honourable profession. You know, and that's the kind of language, that's the kind of way in which um, they, they think about it. So to make that effective, you need other types of clear regulation, I think, to ensure um, that those rights are um, effective. I'm just racing through here. I've no idea. Oh, my Lord. Right. OK. OK. Lawyers just, I don't think I've got that much more. Lawyers, lawyers' responses, again, across the different jurisdictions. It was quite interesting. There were similar problems encountered, although um, slightly tweaked according to you know, diff different cultures and so on. But what they had in common was lawyers were unprepared for the demand. Again, lawyers wanted that right to custodial legal advice. But actually, once they got it, they weren't so prepared um, to actually respond to it. So what we saw in France and the Netherlands, for example, is a valiant effort to widen the pool of duty lawyers so that people could have a lawyer, but widening that pool meant you know, anyone who was a lawyer. So it didn't matter that you weren't a criminal lawyer, you were a lawyer, so you could turn up and, and do lawyer-type things. Um, obviously, that's not um, ideal um, for the suspect. Again, clearly a need for legal aid. That was quite a sticking point. Disclosure. So lawyers in all of those jurisdictions are saying we're really hampered actually in our ability to do this because of disclosure. Again, a need to, so in all those jurisdictions, a need to organise, a need to train, and a need to recognise again, what, you know, to pick up what John was saying, that determinative significance um, of those very early stages. We know that most cases begin and end on the basis of what happens in the police station. Even the French Constitutional Council has recognised that now and said, do you know what, before we didn't think you needed a lawyer in an interview, but now we recognise actually this is the evidence. It's what happens here. So actually you do, we do need to engage these fair trial rights um, in a much more serious way. Also, we know that giving rights with one hand sometimes results in them disappearing with another. So it could be attenuating the right to silence. It could be doubling the um, length of detention. These are all things that we've seen as a consequence of introducing the um, right to a lawyer. But also, having poor legal advice actually can end up putting the suspect in a worse position. So French lawyers understood that straight away. And they just said, we are just legitimating the process. We sit here like a vase. We can't say anything. So I haven't got time to go into all of that detail, but the way in which the provision is put into place into France is you are allowed to be present. But literally, that's all. You, you can be present. So you can't say anything, do anything, intervene. You can just ask questions at the end. And they were very uncomfortable with that because they thought, as I'm here, this seems to legitimate the whole thing or make it harder to challenge. That's what we saw post-pace. Remember those early cases? You had a lawyer. They had been completely hopeless, but whatever. You had a lawyer, so that's going to make it quite difficult um, to challenge. Um, so I'm just repeating myself here now, we know about disclosure, legal aid, accessing lawyers. Um, some little details that we tried to fill in in terms of what can you, what, what's it actually quite difficult to legislate for, how you understand the scope. So you were talking about more member state led understandings of things. So when you say you can be present in an interrogation, what does that mean? Does it mean just present like in France or does it mean an active model as we saw in Dianan? So passive, active. Do you have a consultation? Is it time limited to 30 minutes as it is in France and the Netherlands? It's not very long. First time you meet someone, you know, biographical information, this is what they've got, who are you? Boff, 30 minutes, you're done, it's time to go into the interrogation. Um, and when do you have this? And also, it's incredibly interrogation focused. Now, that's really important, but there's a whole raft of other things that might happen around. Typically, you're going to be in custody for 10 or 20 hours. Your interrogation's maybe going to be an hour or two. What about the other 18 hours when you're in custody? What about making sure you're fit to be detained, there are sufficient charges, it's the correct regime, etc., etc.? Um, or if it's in Scotland, how do we get lawyers to actually go down the police station? Because they just say, we advise silence, and we can do that just as well over the phone. So linked to the interrogation, but we have to think about that wider detention period. All of those things are quite difficult, but you can see that some effort has been made um, in, the EU, in the EU directive to do that. 
And we hadn't quite finished our research and we were very happy that the Commission asked us to do a little report on our preliminary findings to just feed into those. I think there were eight trilogues for that directive. It was a really tricky one to get through. So it was quite good to be able to at least feed some of this in and feel like it might make some kind of a difference. Um, so, uh, how will standards be received and translated in practice? I think I've already talked about that before. Reform alone is not enough, so that's just, just really a kind of a bit of a shout for those softer norms that actually make things work. Codes of practice, professional standards, types of training, maybe linking it to money always works. Everyone responds to money. You don't get illegal aid unless you're actually good at your job, um, those kinds of things. And I think, yes, that's it. Thank you very much.